This video is sponsored by The Great Courses Plus, an on-demand video learning service. Learn at your own pace with no tests and no schedules. Check out The Great Courses through the link in the description below. More about The Great Courses a little later in this video. So today, I view a question because Grayson A asks, what is the original flavor bubblegum supposed to taste like? Bubblegum, the ambiguously flavored, obnoxiously pink candy gum, is the favorite treat of Violet Beauregard and seemingly a shocking amount of stock photo actors. The gum was first invented in 1928 by an accountant called Walter Dimer. Despite being asked in numerous interviews throughout his life, Dimer took the secret of what he was shooting for in the original flavor of bubblegum to his grave, and the company that owns the rights to the recipe likewise isn't talking. But we're going to get to that in a bit. First, the story of how bubblegum became a thing at all. In 1928, Walter Dimer was working as an accountant for the now defunct candy and baseball card manufacturer Fleer. At this time, Flair was struggling financially when then president of the company, Gilbert Mustin, hit upon the idea of creating his own gum base to improve profit margins. At the time, they bought their gum product from another manufacturer before repackaging it and selling it. Towards this end, Mustin began tinkering with recipes but was frequently called away from his work to answer the building's only phone, which was on the first floor while his office and the mixers were on the third. Accordingly, whenever Mustin was called away, Dimer, who worked in an office next door, was called upon to watch over the latest gum batch or lend a hand when necessary. Over time, Mustin began to trust the 23-year-old accountant to such an extent that he was allowed to experiment on his own time, a perk Dimer took frequent advantage of, often spending many hours after a shift mixing random flavors together and tinkering with the Fleer gum base recipe in order to improve it. Following in the footsteps of numerous inventors we've talked about before, Dimer claims he stumbled across the formula for bubblegum partially by accident after about a year of tinkering. In his own words, it was an accident. I was doing something else and ended up with something with bubbles. That said, as with many of these supposed accidents, this isn't quite correct. Dimer's goal was always to create a kind of gum you could blow bubbles with. The accident was perhaps that his day job was actually that of an accountant and his tinkering was decidedly non-scientific. So while it's nice to think that Dimer accidentally mixed a bunch of chemicals together and stumbled across a lotto ticket recipe, the reality is that he spent many hundreds of hours meticulously mixing batches of gum together in the hopes of getting the formula for bubblegum just right, coming remarkably close to doing so on several occasions, only for the results not to repeat when mixed again. Dimer's inspiration for bubblegum was an earlier, never-released prototype product created by Fleer's founder, Frank H. Fleer. This was created in 1906 and it was called Blibba Blubber. Like bubblegum, Blibba Blubber could be used to blow bubbles. However, the gum would stick to teeth, lips, and cheeks. It was much too wet and had poor elasticity. This resulted in any bubbles you managed to blow popping quickly, splattering saliva everywhere, and then adhering tightly to your face and lips. While Dimer's exact recipe isn't publicly known, he claimed that he was able to fix the former problem by adding some unspecified amount of latex, resulting in a more elastic and less sticky gum. That said, this wasn't the only tweak needed, as in his earliest near hits at inventing bubblegum, the resulting gum worked perfectly at first, but had an extremely short shelf life due to an issue with hardening up within a matter of hours after being made. It was this problem that was eventually accidentally fixed by Dimer, though he never publicly mentioned how he fixed it, nor why the solution was supposedly accidentally stumbled upon. Today, wax is typically added to gum to keep it soft at room temperature, and some form of powder like cornstarch is used to keep it from becoming too sticky. Whatever the case, after inventing bubblegum, Dimer scaled up the recipe and created 300 pounds of it. This brings us to why bubblegum is nearly always pink. According to Dimer, when the time came to add food coloring to his first proper batch of bubblegum, the only coloring the company had on hand was pink, which just so happened to be his favorite color. And if that made you go, hmm, well, around this time, pink was actually considered a masculine color, and blue was a favorite feminine color. And you can see our video, the surprisingly recent time when boys wore pink and girls wore blue, and both wore dresses for more information on that one. With no other choice available to him, Dimer poured an entire bottle of pink food coloring into the mixer, giving the candy its now iconic, obnoxiously loud coloration. Over the years, as more companies attempted to create competing products, they similarly colored it pink, leading to it becoming the go-to color for bubblegum. Ultimately, Fleer settled on the name Double Bubble for the product, deciding to individually package the candy in a manner not too dissimilar to how pieces of taffy are traditionally 
finally sold, and then sent a hundred sample pieces to a small store located at 26 Shenek Taddy Street, Philadelphia. The store sold out within a day, prompting Fleer to make several more tons of the bubblegum and begin widely marketing it. In the first year of bubblegum sales alone, Fleer sold $1.5 million worth of the gum, which is about $21 million today, literally saving the company, though Dimer himself never received a dime extra for his non-accounting invention. However, in recognition of his integral role in the creation of the product that saved the company, Fleer promptly fired Dimer from his role as company accountant and made him an executive of sales. His job then included training salesmen on how to blow bubbles so they could demonstrate the product to potential customers. Originally priced at just a penny, bubblegum proved to be immensely popular with Depression-era customers, and as a result, Dimer's job, which he formerly was close to losing due to the company being close to going under, proved to be both secure and rather lucrative during one of the most financially taxing times in American history. While he received no royalties from the product as the years passed, Dimer was paid to travel the globe promoting Double Bubble, eventually being promoted to senior vice president and serving on the company's board of directors. He continued continued to hold the latter board seat for some 15 years after he retired in 1970. Even after retiring, Dimer's love of bubblegum never subsided, and he could frequently be found literally riding an adult-sized tricycle around his retirement village in Pennsylvania, throwing handfuls of free bubblegum, of which he was given a lifetime supply by Fleer, to local children. He also reportedly occasionally invited neighborhood children over to his house for bubblegum-blowing parties. According to Dimer's second wife, Florence, who he married at the age of 91, his first wife Adelaide died in 1990, four years after their two children both died in 1986, though at least leaving them with many grandchildren and great-grandchildren, he made it explicitly clear late in life that he didn't care about not receiving any money for his creation, something that would have made him enormously wealthy had he patented it. As the man himself noted shortly before his death at the age of 92 on January 9, 1988, I've done something with my life. I've made kids happy around the world. Okay, so this brings us around to what the standard flavor of bubblegum is supposed to taste like. The original formula used by Flair was intentionally never elaborated upon, and the recipe is now considered to be a trade secret in the same vein as products like Coca-Cola and Pepsi. And note, contrary to popular belief, it is not true that only two people know the recipe for Coca-Cola. As such, we don't know exactly what flavors and in what quantities they are used to create the iconic flavor of bubblegum. That said, the original ingredients list included sugar dextrose corn syrup, gum base high fructose corn syrup, artificial flavor, color, cornstarch, and BHT. This was later changed to sugar dextrose corn syrup, gum base tapioca dextrin, titanium dioxide, confectioner's glaze, carnauba wax, cornstarch, artificial flavors, artificial colors, FDNC, red 40, blue 1, yellow 5, yellow 6, red 3, and BHT. Digging a little deeper, we have a rough idea of the base flavor ingredients based on interviews with with Dimer, who claims he originally used a combination of wintergreen, peppermint, vanilla, and cinnamon in unspecified quantities to come up with the flavor for the first ever batch of bubblegum. This contrasts slightly with other sources who contest that bubblegum flavor is actually created using a mixture of several natural and artificial fruit flavors, usually strawberry, pineapple, and banana, in varying quantities. The truth is, though, that bubblegum as a flavor can be synthesized using a multitude of chemicals in any number of combinations. So, in the end, the flavor is an artificial construct with no analog in nature. Given this, the answer to the question of what is bubblegum supposed to taste like is, well, bubblegum. So if you enjoyed this little slice of history, well, I'd like to make a recommendation for you. The Great Courses Plus is an on-demand video learning service that teaches you everything about a subject that you want to learn about. Today we've heard a lot about bubblegum, and when I think of bubblegum, other than photos of stock photo people, I think of America. It seems so very American somehow. And today I'd like to recommend the course of a history of the United States. Now you might be thinking, whoa, Simon, that's a pretty big subject to cover the entire history of the US. It's really, really long. It's not really, but a lot did go on in the small amount of time that that country has existed. And you know what the good news is? Well, the course is over 40 hours long, and it takes you from the wilderness to Washington to Watergate. And those are just the W things that I managed to tie together nicely with that alliteration. Let's just say the course is extensive. You can grab this course for only $9.99 or get access to this course and over 10,000 video and audio lectures when you sign up for a free trial through the relevant links below. It's super easy. The great courses are awesome. So is the great courses. Plus, check out whatever you want. Check out that course. It's all very good. 
And as always, thank you for watching.